Hello and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Kyle Wilsey and I'll be walking you through a short presentation on off-grid solar PV systems uh, for critical applications in the gas and oil industry. Uh, we'll first have a quick refresher on the key functional components of any battery-based system and take a close look at special considerations for systems going into hazardous locations or as they're sometimes referred to classified locations within an oil and gas site. Uh, we'll close with a look at a recent case study of a system designed by our partner EcoSoul based in Dubai for the National Oil Company of Kuwait. But uh, first, a little bit about Morningstar, over 4 million units sold in 100 countries, focusing on critical applications across industrial segments. Mainly, we look at telecoms, oil and gas, security, <clears throat> lighting applications, um, but a few others. You know, With the re reputation we've earned for quality and reliability over the years, we've also seen our charge controllers find their way into residential and recreational markets, uh, mobile, RVs, marine, boating, that kind of thing. Um, we're considered to be the charging experts with a wide product line and can claim the lowest hardware failure rate in the industry, certainly well less than a tenth or even a hundredth of a percent. Um, this is a basic depiction of a typical system that would use one of our charge controllers. Uh, mainly, um, we, we work in the DC world, so Here's an example of you know, many of the common types of DC loads that you'd find in a gas and oil field application. But mainly we have the same basic components of any system, um, no matter what the controller uh, selected to be placed in series between the solar modules and the battery. The DC loads would always be powered directly from the battery. You can think of this as uh, an uninterruptible power supply so long as the sun comes out to recharge them. Those loads run directly from the battery, even in cases where they may be wired from a common, a common terminal wiring point within the controller enclosure. The battery directly powers the load. The sun, the solar, um, is always passing its power through the controller into the battery and back out to the load. Um, in any case, the, the load management side of the equation is, is a complex subject, um, one that we don't have time to get into today but we will be addressing on a, an upcoming webinar. Um, no matter what, good system design will maximize the energy harvest from the solar array to provide the necessary power to the load. Um, again, design, system design is not a subject we'll cover here, but it's certainly an aspect of building any system that you know, certainly can't be overlooked. Sometimes AC power is required, in which case a simple inverter may come into play. Um, this is much less common in certainly in oil field applications, but but can be done. Um, and the, the trick is to just simply add a battery-based inverter, either a 12 or 24 volt battery-based inverter like our SureSign, um, to give you an AC power output for generally equipment that might be brought on site by a technician. There's not a lot of AC loads that uh, are native to the site that would run remotely or, or rather um, unattended. Um, but it can be done and relatively done relatively easily. There's no reason that a system also couldn't be hybrid with both DC and AC loads on site. So this is a single line diagram typical of a mid-range 12 or 24 volt system you might find in an oil field application. Um, <clears throat> as oil fields become increasingly networked and digitized, a lot of times protocols other than the traditional SCADA standby uh, Modbus RTU protocol uh, for establishing comms to the controllers becoming quite common. You know, we find we find requirements for SNMP or TCP uh, types of, of connections over an RJ45 Ethernet network. Um, these are becoming largely preferred and, and pretty common. Um, we support these protocols and different physical layer connections for inclusion across the many front end uh, graphical user interfaces depicted here. These are all enabled by our EMC device. You see here the EMC-1. This is a serial to ethernet converter that we've built and, and support ourselves. It provides the link to uh, the controller 
um, for Modbus TCP, SNMP, or, or basic uh, HTTP viewing in a web browser. While we show here a connection to the internet uh, or a wide area network, this certainly doesn't need to be present. We certainly support local area network connections only or even private networks. Really, this is just a attempt to give you a, a general depiction of the most, um, you know, most general building blocks you might find in a system. So now that we understand the layout of a typical battery-based off-grid PV system, um, let's take a step back and look at one of the most basic requirements of a solar PV electric system unique to oil and gas applications, and that is the hazardous location classification. Um, by the way, this is not intended to be an exhaustive training on the subject of hazardous location, but to be successful in designing or even just specifying components into oil and gas applications, it's useful to at least be familiar with and conversant in the basic terminology. Um, so what is hazardous location? In North America, this is defined by a class, division, and group classification system. Uh, this is why you might hear the term classified when describing a particular area at a site. These are classifications of different shades of, uh, of risk within uh, a flammability zone. So the key takeaway here is that systems must be designed in such a way as to not cause any source of ignition under normal operation. So that's a pretty important point, that systems must be designed in such a way as to not cause any source of ignition under normal operation. Component markings, which describe their hazardous location rating, can really vary widely. Um, so when, when examining a component, you know, you really want to look at um, not just the agency, uh, the, the, the lab that rated the product, but take a look specifically at those classification standards you see in this example here. Um, any, you know, it's a common misconception that I find anyway, uh, that, that the mark, the mark from the listing agency or the listing lab it needs to be a UL, um, and in fact, that's just that's just not true. Um, any NRTL, any nationally recognized testing laboratory, can certify a product to these standards, these these classification standards. You know, for example, we use Intertech for our SunSaver certification. And on the front of the uh, terminal cover, you you will see, as I'll show you in a subsequent slide, a, a different marking than UL. But but make no mistake that the product is is tested to and certified to um, the proper standards. Um, the key really is when you're, when you're looking at components and, and examining how, how they're rated is, is to locate the specific class, division, and group markings to understand where they can be uh, cited within a gas and oil site. Just a quick note um, that we, when we talk about this classification system, we're really talking about the North American system. Um, the NEC, the Canadian Standards Association as well, the CSA, they define this three-level class division group um, system, the scheme. But internationally, and we see this quite a bit, the IEC or ATEX certifications um, use a zone and category system. They're really parallel systems with the same intent, um, but it's worth mentioning for those of you that might participate in international markets that the IEC and ATEX is really a parallel scheme. So we're primarily in this discussion concerned with the class one and division two certification within the North American classification system. So PV solar electric systems you know, qualify for placement in hazardous locations, which are division two. That means Gases, vapors, and liquids are not normally present in explosive concentrations. Um, the group that you see listed here, uh, the groupings A, B, C, and D, really refer to the specific materials that may be present, but not normally present in explosive concentrations within that area. 
So any product you see uh, from Morningstar will be will be rated at this level, class one, division two, groups A, B, C, and D. And that's primarily because this is the area where a PV off-grid solar electric system would qualify to be placed. Um, just as reference, under the IEC zone system, this would be referred to as a zone two classification. Um, and you'll find that, again, any of our products that are rated for hazardous locations will follow this same uh, path, class one, division two, group A, B, C, and D. And that's the Sun Saver and the Sun Keeper. Um, so when you're specifying a solar electric system, here's where you'd find it on our Sun Saver. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to see. It's actually printed not only here, but also on this terminal cover uh, embedded into the plastic. This is what you need to locate and, and to specify to, um, whether you're using a Morningstar device or something else. Uh, the Sun Keeper is the other, the other option. Both uh, have the same certification, class one, division two, group A, B, C, and D. Now, PV systems can often be deliberately located outside of classified areas, in which case any non-classified controller uh, or accessory could be used. And in this case, many, many options open up, um, especially when direct SCADA integration is required, choosing a location to site the system within a gas and oil location deliberately in a non-classified area can be a necessity as we'll talk about in the case study. So this would allow for the use of our ProStar, TriStar, or any really any of our MPPT controllers, which are all data enabled um, and come in various uh, amperage ratings. So if data is required, we support both Modbus RTU and TCP common standards, or even SNMP protocols with the addition of our EMC. Um, Again, these are supported on all models uh, outside of the, just the Sun Saver and Sun Keeper, but they must be located outside the classified area. You can search for the, the labeling, the manuals, you just won't find uh, a classification rating or a marking for these products. Um, that may change, but for today, um, we're, stuck with, uh, we're stuck with the Sun Saver and the Sun Keeper for the hazardous zone, TriStar, ProStar, other MPPTs outside the zone. So in any, in any case, you, you'll find one thing, regardless of the hazardous location rating across all those product categories I mentioned, and that is that they're all passively cooled. So that means there are no, no fans, only heat sinks of varying sizes and shapes, orientations, and also only solid state switching. There's no mechanical relays or contactors to wear out or cause a spark. That's true across the board, across all Morningstar uh, controllers, whether they're marked for use in a classified area or not. And that's an important point to note that uh, no matter what you choose, you won't find any moving parts. So to go into the case study a bit, um, and moving on to a, a area where I think this brings together much of what we've just talked about, we chose this one specifically out of uh, hundreds or thousands of, um, of sites where we've deployed um, systems, specifically because it highlights, I think, a growing trend where physical placement outside of the classified area was possible uh, to allow move, movement beyond just the sun saver. Um, it also highlights the extreme environments where our equipment operates reliably. As you can see here in Kuwait, uh, typically in the summer, um, you'll see over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, sometimes even 120 consistently and, and freezing, below freezing during the winter. So it's a pretty challenging environment to, to do business, uh, to reliably operate um, a solar system. EcoSol, one of our longtime partners um, in the Middle East, designed and deployed, deployed an off-grid solar PV system for Kuwait Oil Company, who had a very specific requirement that involved a programmable lighting scheme for the safety and security of workers at the site. A little bit unusual, a little bit of a specialty application. Lighting is not a typical uh, DC load that you'd find in uh, a gas and oil site, but uh, in this case, 
provided a pretty interesting uh, case study to show and highlight some of the unique aspects of the design decisions and performance uh, requirements that went into specifying the system. So you can see here, just from this quote, uh, how absolutely critical the component selection was in this case, which really is a common refrain I hear from customers globally. Um, and that is that the impact of a system failure uh, and the cost of any downtime is so immense that measured in certainly thousands, possibly millions of dollars uh, daily or weekly really is what has driven customers to rely on, on Morningstar. Um, using a Morningstar controller minimizes these risks, um, lets the designer sleep easy at night. In this instance, Ecosol opted for a non-classified, non-hazardous location rated TriStar model controller, um, at least in part due to the need for a relatively large array that was just simply required to support the load and the autonomy um, specified by Kuwait Oil Company. You know, so beyond a certain point, much more than maybe about 30 amps of charging, it becomes really impractical to build a system for, from smaller 6, 10, 12, or 20 amp building blocks with the Sun Saver or the Sun Keeper. So instead, a 45 or a 60 amp TriStar, or even several in parallel, as you can see here, uh, one, two, three, and one for, for loading uh, load control, rather, um, was, a, was a pretty obvious choice, a much more practical approach. Um, another aspect of this design involved redundancy, and that was that ensuring that even if one of the three parallel charging circuits went offline for some reason, um, or even, even during maintenance procedures, that the majority of the charging capacity remained. Um, and that, that's uh, as much as data enablement um, and monitoring through a SCADA system, that's a really common refrain that I hear. Um, just the fact that a redundant system uh, offers so much peace of mind uh, that uh, the TriStar is often chosen for this reason and systems are sighted uh, outside the zone. You also get the data interface, as I said, for SCADA integration, um, which in this case was a requirement, sometimes comes along <clears throat> as a bonus, but you, you really, in some instances when you're using a non-standard battery, battery chemistry um, or developing a custom uh, load, load uh, or lighting scheme, a simple programming interface like you have on the TriStar or the ProStar to, to fine tune the charging for virtually any appropriate battery chemistry is a must have. Um, so this is just a great example of sort of a modular approach to designing systems with Morningstar and the flexibility that a TriStar or a ProStar based system would offer when you have the flexibility to, to move it um, and to use a non-hazardous location rated controller. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about temperature um, and the effect of the anticipated extreme heat in the environment uh, that it had on the design choices. So in a place where we expect temperatures consistently above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, certainly reaching 120 or even 130 at the peak, um, th these temperature swings led to a choice of using parallel redundant TriStars. Um, each of these TriStars is rated to a full 60 amps of output um, up to 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the ambient temperature around the TriStar. No derating will occur uh, so long as the surrounding temperature inside that enclosure uh, stays at 60 or below. Even above 60, the performance is going to start to intentionally uh, derate, but um, will continue well into the 80 to 90 degree temperature range of the, of the heat sink itself. So unlike even the best competing charge controllers, which are typically limited to about 40 C, sometimes 45 C uh, or 104 Fahrenheit before they start to derate, TriStar really gives you a lot of headroom. Um, when you're designing a battery bank that or, or, or specifying and choosing a battery, that is equally as suited for such an extreme 
environment, NICAD is often the specified choice, which does require some special uh, special programming. Um, nothing that's uh, too hard or too difficult, just uh, different uh, different cell uh, regulation voltages, absorption times, and such. So all that's possible with the TriStar. It makes for a nice a nice pairing in that type of environment. If you do want to read the full case study, you can go to our website. We have uh, just a simple PDF available for download that goes into a little bit of detail there. Um, certainly, if you have any questions, always feel free to give us a call or visit us on our website, website MorningstarCorp.com. Thanks. Appreciate you tuning in, and we'll uh, look forward to hearing from you soon.